Hey folks, this is Dr. Emily Scherning with American Resiliency, here with a quick video about hazards beyond climate. Although this hazard is connected to climate change, because as we're living in these times of change, we know living things are on the move. A lot of us, of course, care about assisting in that work, about creating habitat and supporting landscape transformation. But not everything is like pollinators and prairie chickens when we're talking about species changing range. So don't watch this one if you're having a particularly itchy day already, because we're going to talk about mosquitoes. I'm going to help you learn how to identify disease-carrying species of mosquitoes that are currently moving into new habitat throughout the U.S., as well as some of the diseases that they're likely to bring to our communities over the next five to ten years. This is important knowledge to spread. I don't think we can blame our overstressed, overworked healthcare providers for not boning up on their tropical diseases when they've been busy holding together the rural clinics, say. It's also worth noting there's a real possibility of these diseases emerging in the next five years when we should expect limited government surveillance capacity to monitor this type of emerging disease threat. This, it's also a fun video for me because it brings me back to my roots. Since 2012, I've been researching and publishing in the field of science education, working on learning how to communicate with the public. But before that, I was a major microbiology nerd. 20 years ago, when I was a young scientist, I did my work with NASA in microbiology and infectious disease. But although I've got more disease-related knowledge than most people, I'm definitely not a medical doctor. And I'm grateful to say that this script has been reviewed and fact-checked by one of the physicians active in the AR community, Dr. J. And I've got a note to read from her here. So this one's going out to all of you who like to follow emerging disease trends. Here's our quote from Dr. J. Regarding the need for AR members to remain vigilant, there's a very good resource from SIDRAP at the University of Minnesota by Dr. Michael Osterholm. He sends out a daily news summary that gives a brief synopsis of any relevant infectious disease news that's occurred in the past day. He does cover topics like emerging infectious diseases and gives specifics about where they're turning up as well as other pertinent information. The daily newsletter is a very quick way to stay aware of what reports are surfacing on various disease outbreaks, not only in the U.S., but also globally. I would highly recommend that any AR community member who wants to follow infectious disease updates more closely sign up for this free newsletter on the SIDRAP homepage, as we saw right there. You should know this is a verified high value source. The University of Minnesota is very likely to continue to support this work. But let's get to the bugs. Check out these jerks. They look a lot alike. These are 80s Aegypti and 80s Albopictus. Same genus, different species, both carry a lot of the same diseases. I'm popping up this nice size comparison from MosquitoAlert.com, a citizen science effort to track and monitor the presence of these disease-causing organisms globally. You can see that they're quite large, larger than normal North American mosquito species that are going to bite you. With their large size and these striking white spots, you'll be able to see them from several feet away and recognize the threat. You're going to know them when you see them, and now you're going to know that they're a potential disease-carrying danger. It's quite possible that you're looking at them right now and you're like, oh, dang, I have seen these guys. I do recognize these guys. Me too. My first sighting was in Iowa in 2016. They're still transient in area, not well established. I don't see them every year, but I do see them more and more often. Here's what the CDC was saying about their potential range back in 2017. So that's then. And looking forward, it's not going to shock you. These mosquitoes will be moving further north. This summer, summer of 24, I heard my first report of anyone seeing one of these mosquitoes on Lake Superior. And that was a sad day hearing that. It's like there's no place safe from them. But we got to face reality. There are actions we can take on the individual and community level once we understand the threats of these emerging mosquito species. Here are the mosquito-borne diseases that we're going to learn about today that are carried by these emerging tropical mosquitoes, Aedes albopictus and Aedes aegypti. It's not a complete list, but I think that these four are worth learning about and preserving knowledge of their signs so that we can keep our communities safe. These are Zika virus, yellow fever, chikungunya, and dengue fever. We aren't seeing a lot of cases of these diseases in the U.S. yet, and most of the cases we're seeing now are still in people who have recently traveled. For these diseases to spread in the U.S., we need not just the mosquito vector, but also the virus. Right now, the vector, those mosquitoes that carry these viruses, are in the U.S. If these viruses start spreading in the U.S., 
we need to be able to recognize the signs of their diseases if we want to stop them. Let's learn some distinguishing features of these diseases and why you care if these diseases are correctly identified in your community. Let's talk about Zika first. If this is the only one of these four diseases that you've heard of, you're normal. Zika virus makes the news sometimes because there have been so many cases in Florida and because Zika can cause serious lifelong disability in the children of women who catch this virus when they're pregnant. Let me show you. It doesn't happen all the time and there is a range of expression, but women who catch Zika virus when they're pregnant, you can get microcephaly in the developing infant. And you can see there's a range of expression and how severe the head size reduction can be, but this is a lifelong disabling injury. This virus doesn't normally make people all that sick. If you got it, you could think it was just a normal, gross, nonspecific viral illness. But this impact on developing babies, which does have a range of impact and can be more or less severe, is potentially very serious. It's something that any community should care about. There's no cure for Zika virus and there's no vaccine. That means that even if you don't normally stress too much about mosquito bites, for people who are pregnant, people who are thinking about becoming pregnant, protecting yourself against mosquitoes should be a high priority. Keeping on top of Zika incidents in your community or knowing if you're traveling to an area where Zika has been identified as spreading in the community is a present risk worth considering in the U.S. today. Now let's talk about yellow fever. I think that many people don't consider yellow fever as an active worldwide threat, but it is. It's a very serious illness. It's not just from Runyard Kipling novels. This disease is a killer, and the big tell is that it attacks the liver and causes jaundice. The yellow in yellow fever refers to the color of the eye. You can see that there's a striking level of jaundice that develops not in all, but in many patients who are sick with yellow fever. That yellow color, that jaundice, means that the disease is impairing vital functions of the liver, which we need. I don't care how tough your Uncle Bill is. If he's turning yellow, if he's looking jaundice, you need to get him to the doctor. This virus kills about half the people it infects without supportive medical treatment. If you become aware of a yellow fever outbreak, it's time to get serious about mosquito control and infection prevention. I rarely use chemical bug repellents because I don't want to hurt bugs, generally speaking. But if I identified signs of yellow fever in my community, I myself would break out the DEET. I'll admit it. And again, there's a vaccine for this disease. There's an old, well-understood vaccine against yellow fever. We've been able to vaccinate against yellow fever since 1937. If we identify this disease as becoming present in our communities, we could roll out effective community-level prevention. So maybe you heard about Zika virus before in the news. I wouldn't be shocked if you read about yellow fever in old novels. This disease, chikungunya, may be a word that you've never heard before. It's an emerging disease coming out of the tropics with the spread of these mosquitoes that causes a viral illness characterized by fever and severe joint pain. The name comes from a kimakande word that means to become contorted because people afflicted with this disease twist up from pain. Many of the disease symptoms are nonspecific, just general horrible feeling viral illness, but look at what it can do to your joints. Some people experience terrible joint swelling with chikungunya, and it's important to know that this disease potentially causes chronic arthritis for months or up to years after the initial infection. I feel like that's information that I would want to know. If I developed chronic arthritis, I would want to know that I was talking about a linked condition because I'd have some comfort knowing that the arthritis wasn't a separate issue and that this post-viral arthritis does usually get better with time. There's no medication to cure this illness, but there is a vaccine for chikungunya. That means if we get aware when it starts spreading in our communities, we can get ahead of it. The last disease that we're going to talk about today is dengue fever caused by another virus. It is not unusual to see 103 and 104 degree fevers in dengue patients. That extremely high fever is the characteristic symptom of dengue fever, as well as the incredible joint pain. Common name for dengue fever translates to breakbone fever. 
This is a disease that you can catch more than once. There are different serotypes of this virus and they don't confer immunity against each other. Delightful. Again, with this virus, there is no medication available beyond normal supportive treatments, but there is a vaccine. Same as with chikungunya, if we can ID this disease, we have the potential to roll out community level protection. Folks, thanks for spending a little time learning about this today. I feel like as we get ready for the changes that are coming, considering disease is important. If we don't know anything about diseases that are likely to emerge, that are just expanding their normal range, doing their normal things, we could get hit by them and not recognize them, not know how to treat them, not know how to respond. All the mosquito-borne diseases that we're talking about here are preventable to some degree because, of course, you can do things to protect yourself from mosquito bites with barrier methods and with chemical control when appropriate and safe. Three of the four diseases we covered today are preventable by vaccination. When it comes to emerging mosquito-borne disease, we have what it takes to protect our communities. We just need to be able to recognize the threat. Let's keep learning and let's get ready. Hey folks, thanks for watching. I want to take a moment to say thank you to the AR community, to the donors, to the volunteers, to everyone spreading the word online, and especially to everyone doing the work in your households and on the ground. It's thanks to all of you that I can keep doing this work, and I'm so grateful for your support. I'm glad to be getting ready with you, and I look forward to talking with you all again soon.